So I just wanted to start off by uh, thanking the, the presenters that came before me and the patients who are sharing their experience. I, I'm here really learning. I, I, I work a lot in data governance for research generally. And so <coughs> this is a, <coughs> excuse me, a great opportunity for me to learn more about uh, the rare disease space. And uh, special thanks also to the, the uh, students to put together this excellent uh, um, setup, this uh, Silicon Valley setup here. Um, so, and I was just thinking um, that um, uh, I do have a rare condition uh, in this room specifically. Uh, so who here applied to medicine and didn't get in? I, I guess it's just me, so very, very uh, traumatic. There, there, there is a life outside medicine, but. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna focus on um, data and uh, digital technologies, networking technologies, and how those are changing um, how, how we uh, approach medicine and research. Okay, so we've, we've heard the term, uh, the diagnostic odyssey a few times today. Now, there, there's many practical, legal, and policy challenges that uh, rare disease communities face when they're trying to get things that all patients uh, are looking to get, and that's support, that's finding a diagnosis, and that's having access to care. And uh, <clears throat> they face these challenges in many areas. So even where there are treatments available, affordability can be a big challenge because of the small market, um, and maybe the government doesn't co cover those costs. Um, accessibility, so, so uh, uh, if there's an experimental treatment, it's again hard to get uh, a group together for a clinical trial. And so there's issues of accessing new experimental treatments. Um, so, you know, regulatory systems have to adjust for rare disease. And, uh, and the, the real th tr challenge is that for many rare diseases, there just isn't a treatment. So how do we um, make more treatments available? And that really, um, you know, that there's policy questions about how much is the government funding orphan disease research? Are they providing uh, incentives for private, uh, for private sector uh, drug development? And of course, um, you know, patient foundations often step in and do a lot of the work to, to uh, um, push research forward. So it's a long, winding uh, journey to, to get support, uh, diagnosis, and care in rare disease. Now, there, there, there are some uh, societal and technological trends uh, that are, are disrupting the whole of biomedicine um, and that are potentially hoping to shorten uh, that diagnostic or ther therapeutic odyssey. So the first is uh, big data. So this is sort of a buzzword, but the basic idea is we're generating huge volumes or we have the opportunity to ge generate huge volumes of data about patients and collect a wide variety of data. So we have molecular data, we have uh, brain imaging, we have uh, uh, 3D facial or 2D facial uh, imaging. and not only can we generate all these new, newfangled types of data, but patients themselves are contributing to um, uh, the collection of data. They're monitoring their symptoms on their, their mobile phones, and they're, they're generating data as well. So there's, there's a huge volume of data and a huge variety of data that, are, that can be generated about patients with rare disease. But it, it's not enough to just generate a lot of data. You have to know what that data means. And the only way that you can really start to find patterns um, and to determine you know, potentially the genetic cause of a disease uh, is really through collaboration. So uh, one difference between the biomedical world and say other areas is you know, there's not one big monolithic company that holds all the data. There's not a, a Facebook that has 1.87 billion patients. Uh, patient data is generated and held in, in institutions all around the world by researchers and clinicians. So really to achieve that big data, to, to, to establish not just volume of data about patients, but also uh, to establish large enough data sets to um, better understand the causes of disease, um, there needs to be collaboration. So this is just a map of international research collaborations, uh, but increasingly in rare disease, there's also collaborations between clinicians. And the third societal trend is really uh, patient empowerment. I'm so sorry, I don't know why the, the heads of the poor boy was cut off in this slide. Um, but uh, these are just off the top of my head, uh, uh, many of the sort of uh, synonyms for patient empowerment that we're seeing, uh, and this, this has to do with, again, support. So RareConnect uh, is a platform that, that allows patient groups to establish uh, support groups. So they're leveraging uh, networking technology and social media. 
Um, but patients are also getting more engaged in their own care. They're actively going out to, to try and seek a, seek a diagnosis. And they're also getting involved in all, in all sorts of ways in research, whether it's starting foundations like we've seen today, um, and, and, and basically being entrepreneurial, funding research, whether it's collecting data about themselves, um, uh, so citizen science, uh, patient center, or whether it's even establishing uh, research and data infrastructure. So that's the area where I focus, but now we, we're actually seeing, we saw that uh, the foundation is looking to establish a registry and uh, you know, start to collect data. And those registries can be used for many different purposes uh, to recruit people into trials, uh, to, to do, if, if you get really rich data in those registries, you can, you can, you can do discovery research, uh, or you, you, know, you can connect people for support or diagnos diagnostic purposes. Um, so this, this slide that got cut off here is uh, your DNA, your say. Um, just another example of the way that we're including patients in everything we do when it's establishing research priorities or um, <clears throat> determining how we manage and govern data, uh, research data resources. Uh, this was an international survey where we asked people, how do you feel about uh, you know, your genomic data being stored in a big internationally accessible database? Are you okay with companies accessing that data? Are you okay with academic researchers accessing that data, clinicians? Um, and, and so we're, we're making sure that the governments we design reflects the wishes of, of uh, patients. Now, so just to, to take those concepts of big data and, uh, and collaboration and, and just think about the, the, the experience of, of rare disease patients in Canada. Um, so many patients in Canada uh, with suspected rare disease uh, struggle to get a diagnosis and they go through that, that difficult diagnostic odyssey. And the fact is that through our health system, through our public health system, we're not really at a point where we're taking a big data approach. So the, the provincial health systems are not funding uh, whole genome sequencing, the decoding of the entire genome uh, for rare disease patients. Um, but this is slowly changing. So these two initiatives, Care for Rare, has been an ongoing research uh, uh, in rare disease space to, to basically increase the timely diagnosis of rare disease. And just recently, a few weeks ago, Care for Rare Solve, which is the second iteration of this project, was released. And their goal is to um, basically uh, improve and refine whole genome sequencing, so generating lots of uh, molecular data about patients as sort of a standard of care when, when rare disease patients come into the clinic. But it's not just, as I said, about generating lots of data. So not only do they want to, to, to show that um, the best way to speed up diagnosis is to do whole gen genome sequencing, but they're also looking at uh, encouraging collaboration across Canada and internationally. So Care for Rare Solve is gonna, going to establish a nationwide rare disease uh, data repository, which will store genomic, uh, facial imaging, and clinical uh, data uh, that will allow clinicians to connect with each other as well as for researchers to access rich data sets in order to uh, <clears throat> improve diagnosis and care. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about um, one of the applications of collaboration uh, using these data infrastructures. So it's long been, um, it's, it's always been common for physicians to share information about their patients. Uh, maybe the way they did it, if they had a, a patient with a condition and they weren't sure what, what uh, they, they, they'd never seen that patient before, they might call a colleague. They might consult, you know, that's basically standard practice to, in some cases, to refer to a uh, a professional to call another colleague or to consult the literature. But now with, our, with modern uh, networking technologies, there's an opportunity to automate this process. So this is really manual in the old days. You know, you would only get to call one other physician and hopefully they'd seen that one other rare patient. But now we're able to establish a network where you uh, put your patient's data, their genetic data and also their uh, uh, data about their clinical presentation in a database. And uh, then we can run an automatic matching algorithm to see if there's two patients with the same uh, rare mutation. And that give, would give us a lot more confidence that that's the causal gene. Um, so this is actually from an international database called the Matchmaker Exchange, which um, basically takes this approach. And they're developing the, the software algorithms that will allow for automated matching. Now, uh, perhaps Eric will talk a bit more about this in his talk from a scientific point of view. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so the questions I get asked are, what happens when we go from the world of 
um, you know, just informal calling your colleague about an anonymous patient to using these giant international data repositories to share patient data to support timely diagnosis. So there's many, first of all, there's many technical challenges. So in order to achieve this, you know, uh, big data in, in, in medicine, uh, there's many technical challenges. You need people to adopt the same clinical languages. You need them to adopt the same digital languages. So um, here's a few examples of a, of a sort of a clinical standard language to describe uh, um, abnormalities and, and a digital language to describe it. And then, of course, when we get into these rich uh, genomic or, or, or facial imaging data types, um, you know, there's many uh, technical challenges where researchers have to adopt um, um, basically the same uh, file formats, the same uh, analysis pipelines, so that their data can actually be compared. But also from a privacy perspective and a law perspective, these new data types are also problematic from the perspective of being able to anonymize data. So uh, again, when, when the doctor calls his colleague, there's not really a risk of a breach of confidentiality because both of them are professionals, they know each other, they trust each other, and they only share some basic information about what they've seen in their patient. Now it's a little different when you share basically every data point you can possibly think of about a patient and you put it in a database that anyone around the world can access. That does sort of change the situation. So there are legal pra and practical difficulties um, to adopting these cyber infrastructures in medicine. And now I think this is supposed to represent, you know, your hardworking physicians and you're going to slowly be knocked off of the bar by uh, machines. So we're, we're all going to lose our jobs, probably the lawyers first and then shortly after the doctors. Um, but it, it is a little bit different. So if, think about something like consent. So uh, when you go into to, to your physician, you basically, it's implied consent. I want the best care possible. And so if he goes and calls, he doesn't really ask you before he calls his colleague necessarily because that's just part of, that's basically what you'd expect of a patient. But when your, your physician starts sequencing your genome and sharing that uh, around the world, all of a sudden, even though we're trying to achieve the same goal in a much more efficient manner, it does sort of change um, the situation for the patient and their expectations and also uh, legally. So all of a sudden, you're confronting uh, privacy laws, and there may be uh, restrictions on data crossing borders and, and, and specific requirements about the types of questions and information you have to provide to someone before you can do that. So there's a lot of legal, legal challenges to adopting these systems, but they're certainly necessary and essential. And, uh, and, and so it's, um, you know, we need to overcome uh, the inertia that comes with these concerns. So here's just one example of how we're overcoming that inertia. So um, we all know that confidentiality is a professional duty. How many of you are familiar with uh, the obligation to share your patient's data as a professional duty? So this was a recent, a very important recent uh, uh, clinical uh, policy for uh, clinical geneticists and, and lab professionals, basically pointing out, especially for rare disease patients, the importance of sharing uh, genetic findings and genetic data with other professionals and with researchers to really uh, speed up uh, research and improve clinical care. Now, once you build this big cyber infrastructure to uh, promote uh, rapid diagnosis, all of a sudden, you see that there's opportunities to do to other things with that data, to do research. Now, just this was a, uh, the estimates for my international organization I work with, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And so from, in 2030, uh, we predict that between 36 and 83 million uh, genomes will be sequenced uh, in the clinic uh, as part of medical care for people with rare diseases. So this would be a phenomenal resource uh, for genetic research in general, for genetic research into those specific rare diseases. Um, and, and the basic challenge that we need to overcome from a governance perspective is how do we make sure that that data that's collected is used appropriately for care, but is also made available to support what we call a learning health system, where the, the health system improves from the experience and the, and the findings that from each patient. And rare disease is actually the blueprint for the learning health system because every diagnosis is really a true, a new research finding that can be applied in the case of the next patient. And so 
in other common uh, diseases, we're also looking to, to um, um, break down those silos between research and clinic. Um, so just a couple more slides. Um, as I mentioned before, often research fails patients with rare disease. Often the clinical system fails patients with rare disease. And we're really hoping that you know, these, this infrastructure we build will, will, will serve their, 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 um, their best interests. Um, but there are patient groups and patients who are going out and doing it themselves, just like they've gone out to find their, their diagnosis on their own. So these are two examples of platforms, a nonprofit and a private platform, that allow patient groups to leverage their, their networks. So they've already all established uh, international networks to leverage those networks to build uh, research sample and data infrastructure so that can support uh, uh, research into, once you understand the molecular basis of, of a condition, uh, it's, it's much, that's the first step to finding a potential targeted therapy. And one, one interesting thing is that the peer platform, which is uh, designed by the Genetic Alliance uh, uh, in the United States, it actually allows each individual patient to decide exactly who can or cannot access and use their data. So they have little toggles. Do you want other patients to be able to see your data? Yes or no. Do you want your physician to see your data? Yes or no. And do you want uh, commercial pharma researchers, academic researchers, foreign researchers to access your data? Yes or no. And what's amazing about this platform is that when you give patients the choice, rare disease patients, uh, most of them are very willing to be open with their data, much more open than if you let the lawyers decide uh, who should be able to, to access the data. Now, just to conclude on, you know, that sometimes lawyers can also be helpful. Um, this is one, uh, a publication that uh, came out of uh, an international collaboration uh, with our center uh, at McGill, which also supports the Care for Rare Solve uh, uh, from a policy and governance point of view. But we looked at the question of, does a patient have the right to go to their doctor or go to a researcher and say, I want a copy of my genome? Now, why would a patient want a copy of their genome? Maybe they want to tinker with it, but most likely they want to make sure that uh, the maximum amount of value comes out of their data. So they can take that uh, big data, that genomic information that only the hospital at that point has, and they can maybe go to another researcher who's willing to, uh, they can give it to another researcher to do more research, or they can store it in a registry, which can help with um, facilitate target precision uh, recruitment into trials. And now this is a bit, a bit of a controversial area. There's many people that think that uh, patients shouldn't have access to genetic information without proper counseling, without uh, professional guidance, uh, because they're likely to misinterpret it, they're, they're likely to, to lose it, they won't, they won't govern it uh, responsibly. But we looked at, at this as sort of, we looked at it from a legal perspective. And legally, um, you have a right to access your health record, you have a, a right to access uh, your personal information, and in some jurisdiction, in some especially clinical context, uh, there are now emerging interpretations that are suggesting that patients do, uh, will have access to their raw genomic data. So I'll leave it at that point, um, and thanks everyone. I just wanted to point out my colleagues at the Center of Genomics and Policy, and also some of the leaders of the Care for Rare Solve uh, initiative. So check it out on the internet, and it, it promised to be an exciting uh, contribution to the data infrastructure for rare disease.